King Henry called Becca to account. The Archbishop must obey his commands or face exile and ruin. Becket was unmoved. And so he was banished. Stripped of his wealth and exiled with his entire family to France. Benedict of Canterbury, one of the great builder monks of the age, paid tribute to his endurance. For six years he was exiled. But despite the pressures that were brought to bear, he would not submit. He was like a stone hammered and shaped into the walls of a cathedral. The more he was pushed, the firmer he, the more, the more steadfast did he prove. The Christian world was divided by the conflict. Which of the two men would be the first to crack? Under pressure from the Pope, the king backed down. Beckett returned in triumph to Canterbury and promptly sacked three bishops who'd taken the king's side. The bishops who had been excommunicated or uh, suspended from authority went to the king. They met him probably on Christmas Day, 1170, and poured out their anger and their fury that Becket had come back and issued sentences against them. At that moment, Henry loses it and cries out in great anger, what useless drones have I been feeding in my court who are unable to avenge the honor of their lord? He said, the man ate my bread. He came to my court poor and I raised him up high. And now he, he, he kicks me in the teeth. The grief goes to my heart and there's no one to avenge me. It was at that moment that four knights, four barons, apparently hearing these words, saw the opportunity to acquire favor in the king's eyes, and they swore together to go and indeed avenge the honor of their lord. And so four of his men swore an oath to take revenge for the king's shame. Wherever they might find him, they swore they would pull out his tongue and dig his eyes out of his head. And neither church, nor altar, nor holy day would protect him. The first was Reginald Fitzers, son of the man they call the bear, and with all the savagery of that beast. The second, Hugh de Morville, which translates as the village of death. The third, William de Tracy, brave in battle but steeped in sin. The fourth, Richard Le Bret, whose depravity turned him from Brett to brute. So on the fifth day of Christmas, these four barons of the king, with several of their men, came to Canterbury, while others surrounded the city. With Canterbury surrounded, the four knights and a handful of their followers rode into the archbishop's palace. When they went to Canterbury, I think the main aim of the four knights was to capture the archbishop and bring him back, probably to stand trial before the king. They took off their armor, which was the appropriate thing to do, and attempted to arrest him in his own palace. Becket refused to be arrested, partly because they had no mandate. They had no right to arrest him. They were simply four barons from the court without a command from the king. So they withdrew from the presence of the archbishop, went out into the courtyard and put on their armor. While that was happening, the men around Becket, monks and clerks, clearly had apprehensions about what would happen next. And so they dragged the archbishop into the cathedral. But Becket was a reluctant fugitive. There are a number of eyewitness accounts from the monks who were with Becket at the time. Leave it. Leave it. They went to bolt the door of the church, but the archbishop turned to them and said, it is not right to uh, turn the house of prayer into a fortress. It's defense enough without that. 
And then he said, we will triumph over the enemy, not by fighting, but by suffering, for we have come to suffer, not to resist. He asked his attendants of what they were afraid. And when the clerks began to fall into disorder, he said to them, depart, you cowards. Let these blind madmen go on in their career. We charge you in virtue of your obedience not to lock the door. As in so much of Beckett's life, there's conflict and contradiction. On the one hand, he wanted to be the good and great archbishop. On the other, he was a man frightened. Death he could face, but there was the possibility of physical mutilation. And I'm thinking here of castration and blinding. And Thomas was certainly afraid of that. So as he partly fled, I was partly pulled into the cathedral. These conflicting ideas are in his mind. One, stand and defy. The other, possibly flee in case something worse than death will befall you. And he chose to stand and defy. After they had rushed through the open door, they separated. Fitzers taking to the left and the other three turning to the right. The Archbishop had only ascended a few steps and he heard Fitzers say, where is the Archbishop? Hearing this, he turned on his step and he was the first to reply. Well, here I am. He said, why do you come before me now with weapons in your hands? And Fitzers declared, you shall soon find out. Are you not that notorious traitor? I'm no traitor, just the priest of God. What do you want with me? You are the traitor! I am no traitor and I will not come with you! He turned to his left under a pillar uh, with the Virgin Mary, statue of the Virgin Mary on his one side and, and the altar of St. Benedict on the other. He was... And, and then they were all around him shouting. I'm ready. Come on. Do it. Come on. Do it. But you will not lay a hand he on He said to them, bed. I forbid you to touch any one of my followers. But he said, as for me, I willingly embrace death. One of them, I don't know which, struck off his cap. He hit him in the back, between the shoulder blades with his with the flat of his sword and said, run, run, you're dead, you're a dead man. But he wouldn't run. And he was holding on to the pillar and they were shouting, then you'll die and get what you deserve. I'm your archbishop, God's anointed. everything, you were nothing, you bastard. The archbishop called him a pimp because I mean, Fitzherz was the procurer of, of women, uh, loose women for the court. But the archbishop pushed him away. He picked one of them up by the tunic, picked him up with one hand and shook him and flung him to the ground. This was de Tracy, I think. It was Fitzers, the bear, the one they called the bear. I mean, they were all wearing helmets, so all, all you could see was their eyes. Then the knight he was called a pimp aimed a great blow to the archbishop's head. And there was a monk, he put his arm up to ward off the blow. And he cut halfway through my arm. I, I, I felt it cut into the bone. It just went through and I fell back. And the archbishop is, is still holding onto the pillar, but there's a, there's a great wound in his head here. The sword must have glanced off my arm and into his face. And there's blood running down his face, down the side of his face. Then they hit him again, a second blow. He's still holding on to the pillar. But at the third blow, he, uh, he goes down on his hands and knees onto the ground. And as he lay there, another one strikes him, a fourth blow. It was so hard, so much. The sword shears straight through the crown of his head and shatters, breaks on the stone. 
goaded on by the author of this confusion, these butchers then dashed out his brains. And then another, not a knight, but a clerk, Hugh of Horsey, who we call Mo Clark, the evil clerk. He took a dagger and spilled out the brains with the blood all over the pavement. And called out to the others, he won't get up again. Let's go. Then they returned through the cloisters, shouting, Knights of the King, let us go. He is dead. <laughs> 